We're going to finish our last video here in chapter 27. We're going to finish off the second part of our mollusks. Then we're going to continue on with their essential body functions that make them an animal they have to do to survive. So the first one is excretion. So there's cells within their body of the mollusks release nitrogen-containing waste in the blood in the form of ammonia. So they release their waste in the form of ammonia, which is kind of similar to some of the other organisms we've talked about so far. Ammonia is just the waste product. And nephridia will help remove the ammonia from the blood and release it outside the body. So again, that's a specialized organ. It was found in our annelids as well. Now it is found in our mollusks. So nephridia is just an extra excretory extra excretory organ. I'm going to try to say that five times fast. So that is again found in the mollusk will help them remove ammonia. And then for response, uh, the complexity of the nervous system and the ability to respond to environmental conditions will vary among mollusks. So there's a lot of variation among <clears throat> the ability of the nervous systems within this group. And the two-shelled mollusks will have a very simple nervous system to where it's kind of on the very opposite end of that. The octopi and their relatives have the most highly developed nervous system of all invertebrates. So we saw the videos of all the octopi changing color and things like that and how they again are one of one of if not the smartest animal groups out there and they're definitely the most smartest or the most smartest. They are definitely the most advanced invertebrates and they have well-developed brains and this allows them to remember things for long periods of time they are very good problem solvers they have actually been shown in laboratory settings to actually problem solve and things like that so they are a very interesting group and very highly advanced in terms of response so the last one movement this is another thing that varies among uh, varies highly amongst this group uh, snails will secrete mucus along the base of their foot and then they will move over the surface surface using a rippling motion of the foot so if you've seen Gary off of Spongebob moving, he always has kind of a rippling motion going on. And that's actually fairly accurate because that is, in fact, how snails move. And then octopi, or an octopus, and this goes for the squid and cuttlefish as well, they draw water into their mantle cavity, and then they force it out through, that, through their siphon. So we talked about the siphon, how it takes water in, and then so <clears throat> they are able to move by drawing water in and then forcing it out and this water while leaving the body propels the octopus in the opposite direction. So it's almost, it's basically jet propulsion that helps them move. They take it and they suck in the water, and they shoot it out and it propels them. So they move in a very interesting way. And for reproduction, sorry I thought movement was the last one, reproduction. Uh, there's mol mollusks that reproduce sexually by external fertilization. However, there is fertilization that takes place inside the body of the female as well. And there are some mollusks and hermaphrodites and they usually fertilize eggs from another individual. So they pretty much go the whole range in terms of how they can reproduce within this group because they are quite different. And so now we're going to look at the three groups of mollusks and what are their main characteristics. So our three groups that we have, I'll make this bigger so you can see it or move it off the screen so you can't see it at all, are gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods. So these are our three groups right here, gastropods, Bivalves and, bivalves and cephalopods. So our first one are gastropods and these can either be shellless or have a single shell and they move by using their muscular foot located on their ventral side so that would be on the underneath and many gastropods do have a single shell that protects their bodies and when threatened they can pull completely into side their shell and these include things like snails, slugs, sea butterflies, sea hares, limpets, and what's called the nudie branch. So this is kind of a very a very unique group. There are some sea hares or some interesting things. Maybe show you some picture of those in class as well. So those are our gastropods. So our next one is bivalves. And these, as the name would suggest, bi meaning two. So they have two shells that are held together by one or two powerful muscles. And some common examples are clams, oysters, mussels, spelled a different way, M-U-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S, and scallops. And so our last group is the cephalopods. And cephalopods are going to be typically soft-bodied mollusks in which the head is attached to a single foot, and therefore the foot will be divided into tentacles or arms. So again, we saw these, we saw the octopus latching all over that guy's face, so those were his tentacles and arms. That is actually their muscular foot. And cephalopods have eight or more tentacles equipped with sucking discs that grab and hold prey. 
and the most modern cephalopods will have only small internal shells or no shells at all so they've kind of this is a big difference between them and the rest of the groups that they do not have any shells at all and the only present day cephalopods with external shells are what are called nautiluses and we'll probably take a look at those in class as well and cephalopods again going on they have very complex sense organs to help them detect and respond to external stimuli so we saw how well they can camouflage themselves just that's again that's them responding to the external stimuli because they are very soft bodied so they make a lot of food <clears throat> or they make food for a lot of different things so they have to be able to camouflage themselves to, in order to be protected and they can d distinguish shapes by sight so they can see they determine shapes by looking at them however in order to determine the texture of something they actually physically have to touch it and so since this they can distinguish these shapes by sight they must have a very complex eye and that is what the next one is they have a very complex eye that's most much more developed than ours is and so our last one is how do mollusks relate to the rest of the environment so they feed on plants they prey on animals they filter feed algae out of the water and they also eat detritus so they can be a kind of a scavenger type thing as well and also their host to symbiotic algae or to other parasites and others themselves can also be parasites and the last one, the big one, is that mollusks are food for many organisms. So there's a lot of things that are going to eat this group. So that's it for chapter 27. Let me know if you have any questions.